Welcome back, everybody. Another super exciting episode of Pollinate here at Studio B, Wilson's Orchard. You know the drill. Uh, we're out here in a balmy, summery November day. What is it? Getting on the 10th of November, and it's going to hit 70 degrees today. Go figure. Of course, tomorrow it's going to be 30. So, yep, this is Iowa. Like it or leave it. Um, we have with us today a distinguished member of the local food community. Michelle Kenyon has been around uh, for many years, done, worn a lot of different hats and uh, done a lot of good in this area. Um, Michelle is director of Field to Family, which has just a ton of different initiatives that go on and help fill out and expand our local foods environment. So without further ado, Michelle, great to have you. How are you doing today? Oh, wonderful. Thanks for having me, Paul. You betcha. It is a, a very exceptional November day. And uh, Iowa does give us a lot of gifts, and one of those is erratic weather, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Last year, at this time, we were in the single digits. Oh, and, uh, absolutely. Leaves were all on the trees, and uh, we, yeah, we saw a lot of winter injury from, from last year going into it. And uh, But that is our... Blessing and curse being here. It keeps the rift draft out. And, uh, yep. So, Michelle, tell us a little bit about Field of Family. Like, what do you guys do? Uh, some of the more um, promising stuff, some of the challenges that you face. We're going to talk a little bit about that. What What do you got to tell us? So, Field of Family primarily focuses on, focuses on education and access. Education on the values of a community-based food system and access to locally grown foods for our community. We have a central theme of education and do that through the work of a farm to school program. We work with schools and administrators to get local foods into the classroom, local foods education, and food system education. We also um, work with food system nutrition directors to get more local food in the cafeteria throughout the eastern Iowa. We work with a lot of different school districts, but we also work with other institutions, universities, colleges, and um, nursing homes. So your education that goes on there, I assume some of it is classroom-based, that you're talking to teachers, right? And how does that fit in? Does it change like certain curriculum for lower level grades and high school gets different stuff? Or do you guys design the curriculum? How does that work? Our focus is to bring the farm to the classroom, mm. whatever level it is. So we're looking at um, educating farmers on how to engage with classrooms. We're working with school teachers on how to engage with a farmer. We work with all levels um, from pre-K to high school. The three tenets of our farm to school program focus on not just one of them is, of course, to get local foods in the cafeteria, but we also focus on school gardens hmm. or outdoor classrooms, as we like to call them. Students get um, to experience outdoors and learn different ways um, from school gardens. We're not just talking about science, but there's other ways um, to utilize a school garden into existing curriculum for math and even music. So we provide that type of curriculum and that opportunity. Um, but primarily, what we mostly enjoy is to bring the farmer into the classroom so they can talk to the students themselves, answer questions, um, talk about their experiences, bring in some of the food that they're growing, bring in some of the animals that they're raising, hmm. talk about what it's really like to live on a farm, be a farmer, provide food. Um, a lot of kids don't necessarily know that farming is a profession that they could aspire to become. Hmm. So it's nice to learn who is a farmer in their community. We also, you know, have learned that with a lot of kids living in town, they don't always know where their food comes from. So it can be very embarrassing to be from the state of Iowa and have a lot of our school children say that milk comes from the, the supermarket. Mm -hmm. But it, unfortunately, it happens, and it happens a lot. And so we are working to provide mainstream food system education so we can ensure that our students and our children grow up knowing not just where our food comes from, how it's grown, and why it's important to choose local. And are there certain grade levels you think that are more responsive to bringing farmers in or outdoor uh, school-based gardens? 
I think kids are naturally curious about yeah. food yeah. and where it comes from. And of course, dirt. When you're talking about <laughs> dirt or soil education. They want to get in right in the middle of it. So um, outdoor classrooms are just, uh, just something that uh, really resonates with kids. They get to see things grown, just grow their own seeds. Um, it's already part of existing curriculum for the most part, but the immersion of it and and seeing it from seed to to plate on your table is is not as existent. It is not as uh, relevant in the school district. Do, do most schools have garden plots? It used to be that mm. we saw about half of the schools had a school garden. Um, it doesn't happen as much anymore. And that's just time limitations, or what's the... It's not something that's been institutionalized as part of the school district in general. Mm-hmm. It's not something supported. Teachers already have a lot on their plates, so having to work with, with it, to working towards something that isn't already supported and isn't already expected can be a big challenge. So they'll do it year after year, and then at some point, it just gets too overwhelming. Mm-hmm. So we find that a lot of the ones that are successful focus on small projects. So smaller gardens um, with, with a specific focus. So we also need to think about that a lot of the work that needs to be done is over the summer. Mm. So engaging before and after school programs, um, students to help keep that garden going, engaging master gardeners, all of this takes time and effort. We try to support it as much as we can, and there are several gardens that are successful in our school district right now and have been for years. But it takes a, a lot of work by a small amount of people to make that happen. Mm-hmm. And how, how have farmers been pretty receptive to taking time out, going mm-hmm. into schools? Yes. So we host what we call farmer fairs, where we bring the farm to the school. And we have several farmers that come in and talk to the students as they rotate through several different activities. The activities um, focus on soil science and food education. Kids get to meet farmers and of course meet animals that they're growing, um, taste foods that they're growing, learn more about um, the life cycle that they're experiencing, that we're all experiencing. And um, they're very successful events. The kids seem to be engaged, but not only that, the teachers are engaged. Mm -hmm. It's been a really successful educational um, opportunity. Of course, with COVID, we're changing things. We have to pivot a little bit and look at our farm to school chapter um, in a different way. We're working to engage online classrooms, um, work with farmers on how to um, engage classrooms online and uh, and find a way to, to work more uh, closely with teachers rather than administrators. We found that when we went to the administrator um, and pitched our educational opportunity, it was much easier to get to fruition. Um, now we're finding that teachers are running their own little schools. They're taking attendance. You don't call the secretary when your kid has a doctor's appointment. You tell your teacher. So we're working more and more one-on-one with teachers this year so that we can meet those needs for them in the spring and bring the farmers to their virtual classrooms. Um, Volunteers aren't allowed in schools right now Hmm. and probably won't be in the spring as well. So we can't expect a lot of farmers to be entering school buildings in the near future, but we can still have farmers working with virtual classrooms and talking to kids. Sure. We're excited about that. We're also um, sourcing different foods to the school cafeterias. So we have primarily focused on 10 crops in the past. Um, Years and years ago, uh, the Iowa City Community School District worked to bring in apples to the school cafeteria. Way before we existed as a farm to school chapter, they worked with Wilson's Orchard and brought in a lot of apples. Back in 2009, when we formed the Farm to School chapter, they were feeding about 5,500 kids each day. We're up to, at some point last year, they were up to over 8,000 kids each day. And Wilson's Orchard kept that supply going and increased their supply so they can meet a higher demand in the the cafeterias. Um, When we formed our Farm to School chapter and later when we formed our food hub, we 
uh, worked to add more diversity to the school cafeteria of local foods. Um, apples were, was covered, so we were working to bring in zucchini, cucumbers, red and green bell peppers, um, sweet potatoes. And so we have increased the demand from schools for those crops, and we've had to work with a lot more farmers to fill that demand. It's been an amazing journey since we've started when, like I said, feeding 5,500 kids, now feeding over 8,000. Um, but we have been able to meet their demand 100% the last two years. Well. Um, when we first started, the first five years were rough. There wasn't enough food being grown locally to supply the need. Uh, we're very thankful that uh, we have a lot of committed farmers here, a lot of committed farmers to season extension, committed to growing their capacity to meet a larger demand so that we could um, fill the school cafeteria with local foods. There's still a lot more need out there. Um, we're still relying on outdoor you know, outside distributors shipping in food from other states and other countries um, to meet our needs as a food system. It's global food system here, right? Even though we live in one of the most fertile areas of the nation, of the planet, to grow food, um, we rely on a global food supply. So in order for to switch that and transform into more of a local community food system, we're going to need to up the demand, up the supply in our area so we can, um, we can at some point get the majority of our food locally. So it's an interesting sort of chicken and egg problem, isn't it? So you're saying on one hand, we, we need to increase demand, but on the other hand, right now supply probably wouldn't meet it anyways right am i hearing that right is it is the is the main issue you think on the demand side or on the supply side it's both yeah it's both um they need to grow together we've had with covid there's been a, a wonderful change that has happened in a sense in that a lot of the people in this community who have supported efforts for local foods and local farmers in the past um, are now putting their money where they're mouth is hmm. right we've seen csas explode and start waiting lists we've seen um a large amount of demand for more local that we should have been seeing for years now but with covid and with the insecure insecurity it's brought to our community um, we're seeing it play out and that demand is huge. And so working with farmers to meet a sudden increased demand is challenging because they start planning now. They're planning next year's season right now. And they put in the capital to buy seeds, make sure the land is ready. Um, they know what they're going to grow um, by the spring and how much they're going to have, act, you know, be able to supply. So <clears throat> when we're looking at spring some early summer and asking for truckloads of squash um, that's going to be a challenge challenge to meet that demand um, however we have worked with a lot of dedicated and knowledgeable farmers in our area who have been around a long time who have slowly um, and smartly grown their enterprises so each year they have added more asparagus or added more cherry tomatoes um, they've been able to do that by past demand, by people supporting their venture. And that's part of the work that we want to do, that we are trying to do at Field to Family, is to increase that supply by increasing the demand. So promoting local foods and farms, um, getting more access to the market um, so that those farmers can not just plan to grow next season, but the season after that and the season after that. We need our local farmers to provide our food. So on the demand side, I mean, what's the, what are some of the obstacles that are paramount there? What, you know, if you go to a school nutritionist or whoever's in charge of, of uh, deciding what they buy, what's the, I mean, is it, is it all about cost or are there other factors? What are some of their concerns? So there are a lot of different factors at play, obviously. <clears throat> cost is one of them. We have found, though, that um, it can be, local can be very cost competitive with a few crops. Hmm. Um, apples, we found pretty quickly, could be cost competitive. Um, and cherry tomatoes and um, zucchini, cucumbers. 
have become cost competitive because we have farmers who have been able to increase their supply. And you know, there's another concept here too that we we require just in general um, to to work towards more of a community food system, and that's this the local food system infrastructure it needs to exist, right? So it's not just needs. We don't just need the supply. Um, the supply or the demand, the supply requires having farmers that are wholesale ready, that are able to meet food system requirements, food safety requirements, that are able to um, sell by the case mm -hmm. rather than, um, you know, the individual bunch. We we are lucky that we have some farmers that are ready for that, that, that have been growing their capacity so they can get wholesale ready. Um, what we really need is more wholesale ready um, but again, that investment requires the supply and requires the market. So you'll see a lot of farmers who are CSA farmers who are doing quite well right now. Um, we love to see that. It gives them job security. They know what they're growing next year. Mm -hmm. They know that they have a base. And they know that they have the financial resources to do it. And um, we also have the farmers who diversify their markets a lot more and that's where uncertainty comes in with COVID our institutions closed you know schools closed university cafeterias closed restaurants closed for a time as well so all of a sudden the wholesale component became unstable for a moment we're now heading back in the right direction um, meeting those wholesale um, wholesale orders and they're, they're still existing now but it did it did uh, re remind our farmers that nothing is secure in farming. We just talked about the weather. Yeah, it's yeah. unpredictable. So the market's also unpredictable, um, particularly with COVID. So, but having a diversification in market is important. Being able to meet wholesale orders, individual orders, online market, farmers market orders, all those are important. Um, a farmer can't rely on just one unless it's a very secure CSA. So do you get a lot of pushback when you, if you have, say, plenty of zucchini or plenty of cherry tomatoes or, or potatoes or whatever, do you get a pushback from, from the buyers at institutions like the university or like the school districts on, well, we really don't need them or, I mean, is, is it an easy sell? I guess that's my question. So by working with them very closely as partners, um, for the most part, what we've been able to sell them has been pretty easy. It meets their demand. It meets their cost. Um, but we're not selling everything that they need, right? Mm -hmm. They're getting a lot from their suppliers, um, and those suppliers are getting them from the global market. So we currently aren't supplying everything. But for everything that we're able to provide locally, um, it has been an easy sell, at least the partners that we've worked with for years and years. The newer partners that we've had, um, just recently the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship just offered some of the CARES money, the, the funding that goes to support um, our economy because of COVID issues, um, went to farmers and food hubs and schools. And that has been amazing. Schools are now getting money from our from this fund just to purchase from local farmers for their school district. That's never happened before. So uh, our food hub, we're getting phone calls from school districts that we've never heard of before for the first time um, because they have this play money, really. Yeah. And that's been fascinating because um, not all schools are ready for this. A lot of schools um, purchase ready to heat and serve meals. Um, you know, we've gone from preparing in-house everything to now, you know, not having the, wow. the space, the skills, or the equipment to do so. So we're working with a lot of different challenges on those school districts as to, to provide them local foods. Menus are set a month in advance almost for mm. local school districts. They have a lot of different dietary uh, requirements to meet. Um, local foods can more than meet those requirements, but it does take a knowledge base that um, isn't always there. Our nutrition directors are trained um, and used to, very familiar with working with suppliers that um, provide everything that they need without uh, talking about the source, right, so much. So also, you know, the larger school districts have an issue with um, 
distribution within their own school district, right? So Iowa City Community Schools, they have five production kitchens. And so those kitchens um, are the ones that feed the rest of the school buildings. So there's about 30 in all. So um, each production kitchen needs a certain amount of food so that they can meet the demand for the other school districts. And um, so they want everything at one warehouse, everything to come at one warehouse. So if we're if we're bringing in watermelon or cantaloupe, which they love, it's one of the fav- one of the f- students and staff favorites. Um, we're talking about a huge amount of food that's being brought to their warehouse. There's no storage, so it needs to go out to their production kitchens pretty quickly. They take days to process that because they don't normally process, and uh, it's a big production. Um, this school district here in Iowa City, they're committed to it. But not all schools are as committed or have the capacity to take on such a project. (coughs) One of the things that we've worked with the school district to do is um, (laughs) get a stick machine. And it sounds weird, but they have a coin maker. So you put in the squash, you put in the cukes, and it comes out as coins. Um, But they found that at some point (coughs) the zucchini just didn't, didn't go off the tray as much as they expected when it was a coin Um, so they went ahead and invested in a stick maker and made zucchini sticks and it was much easier to process it just took someone to go through it didn't take as much time and we're not talking about any cooking here we're talking about raw zucchini going through Mm. a stick machine and the kids ate it up Mm. of course with the side of ranch however um, they're eating the food if it's a stick over a coin recently I learned that has flipped it's literally now coins that are being eaten more than sticks of zucchini. Fun fact, we, we are constantly dealing with the demand of the eater as well as the nutrition directors or the buyer and trying to meet their needs. And then, of course, working with the farmer to, to provide everything they're asking for. So sweet potatoes, for instance, um, uniformity is important. Mm. Have you seen many uniform sweet potatoes? Um, And when we talk about uniformity, the school district wants small ones. Oh, my. How do you control that as a farmer? It's Mm -hmm. really challenging. Um, But we work with James Nisley uh, from Organic Greens down in Kelowna, who has grown sweet potatoes for the school district for years now, and he's gotten it down. Um, Mm -hmm. They're very happy with his product, and um, the schools bake them, and they've created their own little cinnamon butter to go with it, and it is a very tasty baked sweet potato. Mm -hmm. But it took a lot of time to get there, not just from the farmer, but also the school district to figure that out. So we're working with new new school districts. We're excited to to work with them, introduce them to new types of products. Um, that can be offered right now. We're in November, so we're looking at sweet potatoes pretty heavily. Um, we're also looking at dairy. We just started working to get more dairy into the schools. Um, the school district had to change this year by providing, you know, one by providing to go lunches. Mm-hmm. That has been a challenge, and uh, we've been able to get them um, some yogurt from Country View Dairy. Um, which is a local yogurt just north of here. And that's been a great connection for us just to see diversity Mm -hmm. and local, more support for this dairy that, you know, dairies in general need more support. And and for the school district to be happy with that and order it over and over. So when these foods go into, whether it's a squash or sweet potato or whatever, go into the school lunch program, do kids know that this is grown locally? Is it is there any sort of education that goes on in the cafeteria, or is it just entered into the system? And yes, so we've worked with the school district to make sure there's signage up at the point of sale, POS, what we call it, when the school when the students are getting their food. The school the schools have different um, practices. Let me just back up a bit. Sure. Students um, choose their foods um, for the most part. So they need to choose um, either the main entry or the alternate. And they need to choose two out of the three vegetables, fruits or vegetables. So there's di- different systems in place to help the school cafeteria workers understand what the kids want. So um, mm-hmm. one is number one. 
you get the main number two piece piece for number two um and just raise your hand for sweet potatoes so we have helped them create signage to go along with their system in place so that the kids are able to show their um, preference Hmm. and um for the like for instance the raise your hand for sweet potato shows our sweet potato farmer um and where they how far it traveled to get there um other signage talk We've worked with them to name the, the foods on the menu something more exciting. So mm. instead of just bell peppers, we're, we're doing rainbow strips. Mm. And they are. They're red and, red and green, and they're pretty and yellow. Mm. So we've worked with them to do that. Um, really, though, with 30-plus cafeterias, um, the school workers need to you know, they're the ones that are doing the real work. You know, they're the ones that are selling it to the kids. They're the ones putting out the signage every day, every time it's on the menu. So it takes a lot of effort to to get the kids to to recognize what's local. Um, But at the same time, you know, it's uh, really, we just feel like it's important to have it on there and make sure that they actually get a taste. Because if they actually get a taste, chances are they're going to come back for more. One of the things that you've said that I find it really encouraging is that there is a lot of support, it sounds like, at least at at the local level in Iowa City, there's a lot of support for continuing and developing further the the local food supply chain. Yes, we've been very fortunate. Iowa City Community School Districts have put in quite a big effort into making space for local foods in the school district and the school cafeterias. We also work with Solon Community School District and Clear Creek and Manna, who are also committed. They're smaller, um, and they have a little bit more creativity um, in place. But both the school, dis- school nutrition directors at Solon and Clear Creek and Manna are committed as well, um, and they like to play with recipes. So they find a way to make it work, and they're looking for something new often. We, we enjoy working with those school districts as well. So tell us a little bit about the food hub and how that plays into what you guys mm-hmm. do and how does that fit into this larger local foods supply chain and just the development of an economy around that. Yeah, so um, years ago when we first started working to, and really looking at what this area needed and when it comes to building a more community-based food system, we realized instantly that the infrastructure needs to exist to support it. And the infrastructure, um, we're talking about not just the supply and demand, but the capacity to meet that supply and demand. And we found that we didn't have much. We didn't have a, a large a place where farmers can go and sell wholesale and one full one stop shop. We couldn't we didn't have a place where customers and nutrition directors could go to get just local products. Um, we had a lot of farmers that were very enterprising that were working with some of the schools and working with some of the institutions. Um, Really, and they opened up the doors. But um, for diversification and getting more access to more local types of products, um, there needed to be a food hub. And so we immediately went to work to find out what, what needs to be done to create a food hub in our area. The Johnson County Board of Supervisors recognized this as a very important um, priority of our area um, in order to find a way to prioritize um, a food system that values our our health when it comes to our economy, our environment, and our community health. And so supporting local foods does checks all those boxes. So and tell when we have okay. back up just a minute and just because not everybody might be familiar with what's a food hub. What, yes. what do you so when you know one food hub, you know one food hub. Mm. They're all different. Um, the, there's a USDA definition that provide, that's, that says it's a one warehouse where it handles the aggregation, storage, and distribution of local, locally grown products. It's very vague. Um, so we, um, our food hub, our, the Field of Family Food Hub, is based here in Iowa City. And it works with um, about 30 farmers and about 28 customers, last we checked, um, to provide wholesale local foods. 
Um, so when we talk about selling, when we talk to new partners um, who want to purchase local, we're talking about cases. How many cases per week do you need of this product? Um, we have a warehouse in Iowa City that we share with another entity that um, stores and then we distribute the foods to both Iowa City area and Cedar Rapids area. And what would be some of the typical customers? That So our biggest customer is University of Iowa and the Iowa State Community School District. So we focus a lot on schools. We That's our specialty. Um, we have a lot of experience working with school nutrition directors, both at the university and the elementary level. So we focus on that, but we also work with restaurants and hotels and nursing homes as well to meet their needs. So wherever there's a cafeteria um, that, you know, are sourcing by the case, um, we are working with them or want to work with them. So um, we immediately, you know, our food hub was formed last year um, after years of planning. And immediately we worked with farmers to find out what kind of supply was out there. What can we put um, out there to customers? What, what is available in our area? And um, we have seen this, we have seen um, really come to fruition this food hub concept where we've been able to work with farmers that have certain products that they grow a lot of and we've been able to work with them um, throughout the season to sell out of that product that's our goal is to get their all their product to market as much as possible we have found that we need primary sources of local of every crop that we sell we also need secondary sources due to not just supply but also weather Hmm. other issues that come up um, so we want to keep customers happy and coming back. They're used to putting in an order with their supplier and getting it exactly as they expected, despite, you know, weather or other issues that might impact the growth of that product. So um, we're trying to create that same thing and really just make it as uniform as possible for the buyer, just for make it for them to be easy to get what they need week after week while in season. So uh, we've been able to fulfill um, orders at the wholesale level now for the, this is our, we're completing our first full season since we started. And uh, we've had some up and downs for sure, but, um, and have had to change things quite a bit with COVID. But for the most part, we have been very successful in, in not just meeting the demand of our customers, but also having new customers. We've also had to pivot a little bit by offering um, direct to consumer sales. We did not expect to need to do this, at least not this year, Uh, at least not next year. Um, The direct-to-consumer market for local foods in this area is pretty saturated. And um, so we did not expect to need to fulfill that. However, with COVID, it it suddenly became a a need. Logistics, in other words. Logistics. Mm -hmm. um, The farmer's market was canceled. Mm. Um, Restaurants were closed. People were cooking more at home. Um, uncertainty of our, of our food su- supply. People went to local sources, and the need was there. And um, so we pivoted to offer an online farmers market, working with the city of Iowa City. And uh, we have really um, gotten out of our comfort zone and learned a lot, and rallied the troops, and have put about $450,000 into the local foods economy through that venture. Wow. Um, all that went right to vendors on the, on the online marketplace. So do you guys have software that if, if I'm Janet growing green peppers and they need to go to the university, how do I get an order? How do I, is that done by phone or is it all electronic or? So that's part of, I mean, we've been building this food hub for years. We had built out our cooling system, built out our food storage system, built out our transportation. Um, We were in a really good spot. And we decided about a year ago, yeah, it was back about a year ago, that we were gonna invest in uh, software that would make it easier for our customers and our farmers. So farmers um, upload their products, upload their availability, and um, each week, and we, um, 
put it out to our customers each week for ordering and we deliver twice a week. So yes, we invested in um, what's called Local Food Marketplace, which is uh, a software that several other food hubs have used and farmers have used. Um, It has some bells and whistles that we have truly enjoyed. We did not expect to use it for direct-to-consumer sales. We expected to use it for our wholesale customers. And right now we're using it for both. We have two order cycles in there, one for wholesale customers, one for direct-to-consumers. And um, customers have registration in there. All their information is saved. And like I said, farmers just need to meet their deadline for telling us what products they need added to the system, if there, if any. And, and then they go in and just update their availability. It makes it a lot smoother than what it was before. We built out our own software before with Google Sheets. It was amazing, um, but uh, limiting. So this one uh, makes it easier for everybody. We, you know... We were building this hub over years and really have um, have utilized every component of it, of Mm -hmm. that infrastructure this year. So what are some of the what are some of the difficulties that you see both now and and that you've had to overcome and putting a food hub together? Sounds like quite a challenge. getting It has been quite a challenge. Um, Infrastructure and space in this in this area is is hard to come by, um, space in general. So we're lucky to be able to share a warehouse uh, with Table to Table, um, which has been around for 40 plus years, working to eliminate food waste in our community. Um, They have a distribution system to take food waste and put it where it's most needed. It's already just an amazing um, institution that they've created um, to help create a more sustainable food system they create more access and of course less food waste which is very important but we've been able to work with them to share their warehouse they didn't need all the space we needed we needed most of the space some of the time we've been able to also well we have our own um, transportation and a fleet they have a fleet of their own so if ever we have an issue with ours um, our reefer Van, we're able to utilize their theirs as well as their box truck. Hmm. We don't need a box truck often, um, but we do need it a few times a year. So, and we want to get to the point, of course, where we're using a box truck more often. But at the same time, we're growing steadily. We're able to utilize and share um, infrastructure with other organizations, which has been amazing. That collaborative nature in our in our community has really um, been able to create. A true community venture. So you've been at this a long time, Michelle. You've been in right in the trenches, uh, doing lots of different stuff, wearing hats, like I said, of local foods. What? Let's back up here a minute and just talk about the, the sort of from the sort of airplane view, looking down at at local foods in this area. How? I mean, are you at all surprised at at uh, where we're at today? Um, you know what? What do you see as holding us back from doing more in this area you know how I, you know we we you and i share a, i think a vision of you know really robust uh supply chain with lots of farmers growing ample quantities and lots of demand from you know really great institutional buyers like the university and like the school district um but also you know direct to consumers and things like that what are you first of all you know are are you happy with where we're at are you surprised that we're not further or that we're this far every day that the food hubs open i see it as a a success Hmm. um every time we fill one order is a success so my definition of a success is pretty small (laughs) yes pretty limiting but um in general i have lived here a long time uh I am a transplant. I grew up in Missouri. My mother and her family grew up here in Iowa. So to me, it was familiar territory. But I feel like I've seen Iowa squander a lot of opportunities. Um, We have fertile land, as we were talking about. We have a beautiful landscape. We have amazing topsoil. We have committed farmers. Yet we have a serious issue with air quality and soil quality and water quality. And it is really disappointing to see the opportunity that we've squandered. 
And I want to see better for Iowa. I want a better state. I want a better nation for us all. Mm. I have children. I want them to, you know, grow up in a place that chooses health over wealth, Mm. I guess, that we need to look at everything we do, including our growing practices, including where our food comes from, and make sure that it is grown um, in a way that benefits and enhances our environment and our economy and our health, bottom line. So every time someone makes that choice, it helps. It gets us further to that goal. Um, but we need true systemic changes in order to really get there for everybody. And right now, we're not looking at a, a happy future when it comes to agriculture. We're depleting our resources in a major way. Um, we're heading in the wrong direction. So we need to turn this around pretty quick. And yes, we have some, I mean, we can't just do it on a dime, obviously. We need the supply, but every investment towards this direction of choosing health and choosing sustainability is well spent. You know, one of the things that I've noticed, and I mean, well, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious, isn't it, is that the the sort of tailwind that we see with local foods, there is a broad acceptance and engagement with uh, local farmers. And that has been beneficial to me in, in many, many ways, but none more importantly than the price of food has gone up. You know, the, the people put a value on locally grown stuff. When, you know, when I grew up, you know, if you went to a you pick apple orchard, it was because the apples there were half the price that they were mm-hmm. at the local supermarket. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's just why you did it. You went and you bought bushels and you made applesauce or did this, did that. It's a different world today, but nobody, I don't think, uh, goes out and buys local food that isn't expecting to pay more than they will for the stuff that was grown in California and shipped across the country or grown in New Zealand and flown across the world. Um, There's just an expectation that local is going to be more flavorful, probably more nutritious, and certainly they're going to spend more for it. And I think the interesting thing about that to me is the trickle down to where higher costs for food grown locally means a better chance for younger people to get into the game. And that's one of the things that you know, you talked about the number of CSAs in this area, which is fantastic. Um, there's just a lot of local young people getting into the farm game, and I think that's a really promising development. Do you see? Do you see stuff like that, or, or, or am I looking at it with rose-colored glasses? There, I think there's a lot to be hopeful for. Absolutely, yeah. we put together. Uh, we have a database online, searchable, where you can find local food, local farmers in our area. We add to that each year, every year. Um, unfortunately, we take off a couple too, but we add more than we take off, which is nice. Um, there's more people living here um, than other parts of the state. Um, our population is growing in this area, so we are able to provide. Um, the community with more food and more and more people are choosing it I you know we've seen a huge shift in the demand for local foods with COVID we have it's been very hopeful on one hand I'm like where were you all (laughs) last year and the year before you say you're with us but hey but now they've shown their commitment. This community has really come out. Um, our biggest challenge now is to maintain that demand, maintain that community commitment to choosing local while in season. And um, it's something that we're definitely game for and working hard to do. We definitely need more farmers or more land um, growing more food. What do you think is the biggest impediment to that i mean i know land prices are high here Mm -hmm. it's not that easy to find an affordable piece of ground to get started on but are there other things beyond that that are stopping people from meeting the demand that's there oh sure Uh, iowa as a state uh, really values one or two or three or four crops there's very few crops very few of them actually end up in iowans kitchen table you know, uh, this state needs to start valuing um, 
foods that we can eat, basically. Uh, we need to look at diversification of our, the crops that we're growing, um, ways of growing those crops that benefit and, and repair the damage that we've done over decades. Um, we have a lot that we could do as a state to really uh, make a difference when it comes to whether we're choosing a global food system or a community-based food system. We spend a lot of resources meeting a demand overseas um, for various crops. I want us to see more of a commitment to meet the demand in our own communities. Well said. How do people get in touch with you guys if they're... Sure, fieldoffamily.org. We're around. Uh, we're, a, we're very virtual these days, though. Mm. We're... So email is good. Um, director at fieldtofamily.org is my email. And uh, we have a Facebook page, too. We try to keep it in an Instagram because that's the way to go these days, Thank we you. hear. So we're trying to, to promote local foods and farms, not just the ones that go through a food hub, but all the ones that are providing food to the community in our area. Fantastic. So thanks for having me, Paul. This thanks for nice. coming out. This has been great. Yeah. And... Uh, Look forward to hearing more about the Food Hub as it develops. And, and uh, yeah. And thanks to all of you for joining us today on the on this Pollinate podcast. On a, as I said, on a summer November day. Um, and tomorrow will be winter. Stay tuned.